Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the International Spy Museum. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education here. We are delighted to have you here for Spy Chat Live with Christopher A. Ray, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, in conversation with the Spy Museum Executive Director Chris Costa. Tonight's program deeply supports the International Spy Museum's goal to contribute to a more informed national and global citizenry and increase people's capacity to address complex, challenging issues. It's an honor to have Director Ray with us tonight. Christopher A. Ray became the eighth director of the FBI on August 2, 2017. He began his law enforcement career in 1997, serving in the Department of Justice as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. In 2001, Ray was named Associate Deputy Attorney General and then Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General in the office of the Deputy Attorney General here in Washington, D.C. Ray was nominated by President George W. Bush in 2003 to be the Assistant Attorney General for DOJ's Criminal Division. In 1993, Ray joined the international law firm of King and Spaulding, where he spent a total of almost 17 years practicing law in the area of government investigations and white collar crime. At the time of his nomination to be FBI director, Ray was chair of the firm's Special Matters and Government Investigations Practice Group. Leading the conversation with Director Ray is International Spy Museum Executive Director Chris Costa. Costa joined the International Spy Museum in 2018. Previously, he served as the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Counterterrorism on the National Security Council. Costa is a former intelligence officer of 34 years, with 25 of those in active duty in hotspots such as Panama, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Costa is in the Commando Hall of Honor for extraordinary and enduring service to special operations forces. And I really thought he was gonna cut that line out. He never lets me say that. So I'm super excited he left it in. We're so pleased we can offer this program in person and via live stream. I wanna encourage you to submit your questions early. I know we will have a lot of them. We will do our best to tackle as many as possible. We will get to those after Chris Costa and Director Ray conclude their discussion. Now, without further ado, Chris Costa and Director <clears throat> Ray. Amanda, thanks for the introductions. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us for Spy Chat Live, and we have a big virtual audience. Director, it's great to see you again. This is a great opportunity to engage with you again. We've done this before, it's deja vu. So it's uh, welcome back to the museum. Well, it's great to see you. It's great to be here. I'm a big fan of the museum, and obviously I always enjoy talking to you. Thanks. So what I want to do, Director, is dive right in. I have a series of questions, my prerogative, I'd like to ask you. And then we're going to roll into some questions that we're going to receive uh, virtually as well as from our uh, audience here tonight. So I'm going to dive right in. The FBI has a unique place in the U.S. government as both the lead federal law enforcement agency and as a member of the U.S. intelligence community. How do you balance both of those roles and responsibilities, and is there ever any tension between the two of those roles? I mean, I actually think of those two roles as complementing each other. I think our role as a law enforcement agency makes us more effective as an intelligence agency and vice versa. Um, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that, and certainly when I compare notes with my foreign counterparts, which I do all the time, some of which are structured differently. Uh, most of them uh, tell me how much they envy our structure uh, of having it all under one, one roof. And I think part of that is because of the ways in which the threats uh, have evolved and the need to be agile in dealing with those threats. The, the era of uh, kind of national security threats over here and traditional criminal threats over here 
um, is largely gone and is largely over, overly simplistic. Um, and the separating of those roles, I think, runs a very real risk of, at best, artificial stovepiping, and at worst, delays, balls getting dropped, and so forth. So why do I say that? I mean, you could take, take cyber. Uh, it has become increasingly hard to tell where nation state cyber activity ends and traditional criminal cyber activity begins, which there's more and more of a blending of the threat. Uh, and you certainly wouldn't want to have two different agencies right. trying to deal with that. Um, so that manifests itself in ways like we see nation states, foreign intelligence services, the Russians, the Chinese, Iranians, hiring cyber criminals, think of them like cyber mercenaries, in effect, to do a lot of their work. We also see uh, members of those same intelligence services making extra money on the side, almost moonlighting, right. engaging in cyber criminal activity. We also see those same intelligence services using um, cyber criminal tools to conduct their attacks because they think it better hides the role of the government. So we've seen, for example, ransomware attacks that aren't really ransomware attacks. They're essentially a foreign government engaged in a cyber attack disguised as a, as a ransomware attack. So it's, it's on cyber. Uh, it's in counterterrorism. You uh, more and more these days, you, you, we might catch an attack that's unfolding and not know at the time that we disrupt the attack right. what the motivation is. And you sure as heck wouldn't want to have a situation where the FBI had to sit and wait to figure out whether there was a counterterrorism nexus to be able to rush in and help. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of situations where you see uh, threat actors who are motivated by not only a mishmash of ideologies, but they're mixing their ideologies with kind of personal grievances, like a, an employer or former employer that they're ticked off at or something. And so, again, this idea of kind of neatly splitting them apart is just not realistic. Um, but you could go through any number of other examples. Take the cartels. The cartels are both a, a law enforcement threat mm -hmm. and a national security threat. Um, and so we think it's important to be able to respond nimbly and effectively to those threats by treating them as both uh, and not having a left-hand, right-hand problem that would unfold. And the same thing goes when you take it out of the realm of national security and look at the integration of intelligence and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel very strongly that our intelligence role makes us more effective as a law enforcement agency because we know how to maximize impact based on the intelligence. But by the same token, I think our intelligence folks are a lot better at what they do because they know and they work every day with people who have to use that intelligence and action that intelligence. So they know how to make their intelligence useful and actionable. And that's why we have analysts, intelligence analysts and agents training together at Quantico. That's why when I go, uh, I've been to all 56 of the FBI's field offices twice. That's uh, impressive. I'm on my third round now. Uh, and everywhere I go, they, you know, you get briefed on a case. They've got intelligence analysts and law enforcement, uh, you know, intelligence analysts and the case agents sitting side Hand by side glove. working together. Uh, and I think that integration is critical to, to our success. At the end of the day, Intelligence is just a fancy word for information that drives decision making and good intelligence drives better decision making. So that's to me what it's what it's all about. So I've I've, I've seen that evolve and I think we learned a lot of lessons from counterterrorism on breaking down the stovepipe. So I appreciate you and, using that term. And to the to that point on stovepipes, um, I think sort of buried in your question as well. When I look at the intelligence community today, uh, the community part of that is so much more pronounced than what I saw, you know, when I was, I mean, I was in FBI headquarters on 9-11 when it, you know, and I look at the, the difference. Today, in my morning meetings, there's senior executives from CIA, NSA, and DIA who are sitting in my inner circle working with my team 
you know, every day. And, and my counterparts at CIA and NSA have much the same. And the closeness and the cohesion um, is really a, a, a sight to behold. And so in an environment where there's plenty to be pessimistic about in today's world, uh, that's one thing that um, should give everybody a lot of, a lot of encouragement. So, Director, you mentioned the Iranians briefly, and I wanted to dive in and transition to some activities by the Iranians or surrogates just one year after the FBI disrupted an Iranian assassination plot to silence an American journalist here on U.S. soil. A second targeted plot was unfoiled, uh, again, with the same journalist. So two plots against the same journalist here in the United States, on our terrain, here in the, the States. What does that say about Iran's operational persistence? I think it says, it shows the lengths to which the Iranian regime will go to silence uh, their critics, not just in Iran, but here. Uh, and you could look across the threat spectrum and the Iranian regime is showing a level of brazenness and aggression that is palpable uh, and different. In the last couple of years alone, we've had Iranian actors conduct a cyber attack on a children's hospital in New England, try to assassinate the former U.S. National Security Advisor in the United States, as you said, try to kidnap and then assassinate an American journalist right smack in the middle of New York City, uh, tried to conduct a covert influence campaign in the 2020 presidential election uh, to undermine American confidence in democracy that Director Ratcliffe and I did a, you know, a press conference on in October of 2020. That's all on top of uh, constantly trying to evade international sanctions and being the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. So if that's not enough to convince people that this is a serious threat, I don't know what is, but uh, I'm very proud of the work uh, in the case that you mentioned that we were able to do uh, in that case with NYPD and other cases with other partners. Um, and as long as the Iranians uh, keep trying stuff like this, they're gonna keep encountering the FBI. And it's that hybridized threat that you alluded to earlier. So I'm going to change gears a little bit. You knew this question was coming. Section 702 surveillance powers. They're set to expire at the end of the year. Biden administration officials have said that loss of these powers would be devastating. If you could just share with the audience, what do those powers mean and what's the implications? What's the impact if the FBI loses that critical surveillance tool? Well, the first thing I would say is uh, 702 authority is vital, absolutely vital, not important, not nice to have, not it, vital. Um, it is what is a crucial tool in our ability to protect Americans from foreign threats. What kind of foreign threats am I talking about? I'm talking about China, Russia, Iran. I'm talking about foreign terrorist organizations, Al Qaeda, ISIS. Um, et cetera, uh, and I'm talking malicious nation state foreign cyber actors. Um, and what, what people I think basically need to understand about 702 is that it is authority that allows the intelligence community to target non-US persons overseas outside the United States in national security investigations. Um, and it is not the same thing. A lot of Americans now in these days have heard of FISA. Uh, this is not that FISA. It's a totally different authority. Uh, and in fact, the FBI's role, the FBI's um, access to 702 information, we only receive a very small, very, very small, like single digit percentage of the intelligence community's overall 702 collection, all this foreign collection. But that very small percentage that we get, we the FBI get, I would argue in some ways is the most important small percentage because that's the percentage right. that relates to protecting Americans here domestically in the homeland. Now, 
uh, I mentioned some of the threats. You know, you could look out over the next five years, and I could uh, walk you through each of the various hot spots in terms of foreign terrorism and argue why we're going to need more and more access to 702 now that we're not in Afghanistan. You That's look right. at what's happening in Syria. You could look at what's happening in parts of Africa. I just talked about the Iranian threat. Uh, that's just on the terrorism side. China, I've been very vocal since early in my tenure that there is no country, underline no country, that represents a broader, more severe counterintelligence threat to the United States than the People's Republic of China. Uh, and limiting or hobbling or losing our access to 702 would, in my view, be a form of unilateral disarmament in the face of the Chinese Communist Party. In addition, cyber. Most of, or at least an awful lot of what we use 702 for these days is to help in the context of foreign cyber attacks on America. And 702 is what enables us to identify who the victims are, identify what the intrusion activity is, and work with them to better to reach out to victims, many of whom don't even know they're being targeted or uh, compromised, and to warn them and help them then remediate and mitigate the cyber activity. So it's, it's helping us protect American victim companies, universities, individuals from foreign cyber attacks. I guess a few other things I would say about 702, because this is a subject that um, doesn't lend itself to a quick soundbite or a quick tweet or something. So much of the debate about 702 revolves around the FBI's uh, ability to look through or query 702 information. When you hear that, what you basically should picture is we have information that is already, and this is not disputed, lawfully in our possession lawfully collected, and we can query, like look through that information that's already there. It's not new collection. We're not, we don't have some new search authority or anything like that. You think of it almost like everybody here has, a, uh, has email outlook or whatever it is you have. You know, you all have that, um, that search bar in your email inbox, and if you want to try to figure out emails between particular people on a particular subject, you can type in in the search bar and look through what's in your inbox instead of spending days and days and days trying to figure out what's in there. Um, that's what we're doing when we run these queries. We have had, and part of the reason there's such a debate is we have had, we the FBI, have had compliance failures over the years. Uh, and I make no bones about that. Uh, I take that very seriously and it's something that's not acceptable and it's something that we've taken great pains in the last couple of years to address, we've put in place extensive, extensive reforms. And I'm talking about massive changes to training, policies and procedures, new uh, oversight requirements and pre-approvals. I created a whole new office of internal audit focused just on FISA compliance. Uh, and it's working, mm -hmm. it's working. And I say that not just because you can ask, you know, don't just take my word for it, you can look at the various outside reviews that have been done. Uh, in the last little bit, people have started to have reports that reflect our activity since all those reforms were put in place. And those reports show, for example, the FISA court uh, recently found like 99 or 98 percent compliance and talked about how the reforms that I just described were starting to really work. Uh, DOJ had a report the last couple, I think, have shown like 98, 99% compliance. Uh, ODNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, their report showed a huge like 90-something percent drop in, in querying of US, U.S. persons. This Office of Internal Audit that I talked about created showed a, an increase to like 96% compliance since we put all these reforms in place. But part of the reason I say all that is because one of the challenges we've encountered, we FBI have encountered, is that an awful lot of the news reporting 
and certainly an awful lot of the um, punditry around the news reporting about the FBI's compliance failures has been about reports that cover activity before all those reforms. So even though they may have come out you know, in the last year, almost without exception, all these negative reports have been about activity that predates all those reforms. Only now, in the last several weeks or so, are we starting to get reports that capture after all those reforms. And that's important because I want people to know that we take compliance very seriously. We want to do everything we can to ensure that we are careful stewards of this authority. But for heaven's sakes, we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater because this is a tool that we use to keep Americans safe from very serious foreign threats. Um, and I, I hope, I hope in the end of the, at the end of the day that Congress will, will see it that way too. Well, thank you for that, Director. That was a very comprehensive explanation, but I think it's super... That's a nice way of saying I was long-winded. No, yeah. no, no. <laughs> it was super useful, and I was paying attention to your wording, and I learned some additional pieces. And I, I want the audience to know that I, I read a piece by Matt Olson at DOJ, Department of Justice Today, U.S. Department of Justice, and uh, Josh Geltzer from, from the White House of certainly a friend of spy, if I could say that. And uh, they made the case that this would be self-inflicted. And having been a CT, counterterrorism practitioner, it, th these authorities or these capabilities were conceived as CT measures. And I, I think they were so useful. So I, I hope that Congress acts appropriately. Um, transition a little bit. This is a story that really got my attention back in December. A Libyan intelligence operative was taken into custody last December by the FBI, extradited to the United States to face prosecution for one of the deadliest terrorist attacks in American history, the 1988 bombing of an American jetliner, Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland. I remember when that happened. There are some people in this room that know we knew people on that aircraft. Um, <clears throat> you and I both had an opportunity to attend a conference on counterterrorism in Las Vegas. Of course, you were a keynote. I was just a speaker. And you chose, you made a deliberate decision to talk about this investigation. And the question I have is, why did you cho choose to speak about this particular international terrorism case? A number of reasons. I, the first is uh, it was a useful way to remind the audience that notwithstanding the fact that terrorism doesn't get the same level of attention sometimes in news circles these days as it did earlier in my career and yours, That's right. that terrorism, both foreign and domestic, remains the FBI's number one priority. Uh, and I don't envision that changing. Uh, so that was one. Uh, a second reason was that even though uh, our approach to tackling the terrorist threats has evolved both between Pan Am 103 and 9-11 and from 9-11 to the present. And there have been different, uh, different approaches, different tactics, different strategies, different epiphanies about how to deal with the threat. What hasn't changed is the tenacity that the FBI uh, brings to this particular fight, frankly, brings to our mission overall. You've, everybody's heard the saying, the FBI always gets its man. We got our man. I mean, this was 34 years after the attack. It involved generations of FBI employees working on it. Um, but this was the bomb maker of the bomb that brought down the plane that killed 270 people a couple days before Christmas that year. Um, and uh, we're very proud of the work we did with a number of foreign partners um, and domestic partners uh, to bring him back to the US. Uh, and I think it underscores um, the message that the FBI has a long memory and an even longer reach, and we never, ever give up. Well, 
I want to offer a, a footnote. So yesterday, and you're probably far too busy to, to see things that I have written. I published an article yesterday, an opinion piece that we're going to share with the audience about the long arm of justice, because the story that you shared just now resonated with me, but also uh, there was a piece during the, uh, while I was serving at President Trump's National Security Council, you remember Mustafa al-Imam uh, also was brought from North Africa to the United States to face justice. So I think it's an important time of year when we hit the September 11th anniversary to remember that, it, yes, 9-11 was absolutely a milestone, but similarly, Benghazi happened and other events happened, and I think it's really important to keep in mind that our foreign partners working with us are relentless, so I really appreciate you sharing that, Director. So I don't want to get off the topic of terrorism, so I have another question. Um, recently, President Biden said that white supremacy is the greatest terrorism threat to the American homeland. So a two-part question. How do you see the threat of domestic terrorism, and what is the FBI doing about these particular threats? So we have for some time uh, assessed uh, that the domestic terrorist threat is persistent. Um, and in fact, we uh, in, I think it was the summer of 2019, uh, July of 2019, elevated uh, racially motivated violent extremism to uh, a national threat priority on the same level with ISIS, for example. Um, and then more recently, we've done the same thing, uh, elevating what we call anti-government, anti-authority violent extremism, which encompasses everything from militia violent extremists to anarchist violent extremists. Uh, and I think it's a reflection of uh, the significance of that threat in today's environment. Uh, we uh, all too often see people who uh, have turned from angry hateful rhetoric to violence. And we, to be clear, we, the FBI, do not and will not investigate beliefs, ideology, or rhetoric, no matter how despicable it is. But when those things turn to violence or attempts to commit violence, uh, then we have a responsibility to act, and we will, uh, and we have. Um, and we, in domestic terrorism, in one sense, is not a new thing. You go back to Oklahoma City bombing, for example, and you can go back even further than that. But what is new in today's environment, uh, in many ways, is the role of social media as an accelerant to the threat. So you have now, you've always had angry, disaffected people in this country and in every country, you know, who might be inclined to act on their anger. But in the past, you know, the angry, disaffected guy living in mom's basement, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that, I, you know, but uh, would just be by himself stewing away. Now, the angry, disaffected guy in one mom's basement is able to communicate with an entire community all over the country of other guys in other basements, and they can egg each other on. Uh, and now, you know, the, the tendency to act on that anger through violence uh, becomes much more real. Um, and, you know, again, we guard very uh, seriously people's First Amendment rights. Uh, but there is a right way under the First Amendment to express what you're angry about and who you're angry with. And violence, attempts to commit violence, is just not it. Um, and so we have to act in that situation. And part of what makes this threat so challenging, as well as a sort of similar category of homegrown violent extremism, which we use to describe uh, kind of jihadist-inspired violent extremists here in the United States. Um, what, what they have in common is you're talking about largely lone actors who are committing attacks uh, through fairly crude means, think a gun, a knife, a car, a crude IED that you could figure out how to build, you know, off of the internet. Um, and 
they're picking soft targets, which is just, as you know, sort of intelligence community speak for really any place everyday people are living their everyday lives. And unlike the, the counterterrorism threat of 9-11 where you have like a sleeper cell and they're planning for years and they're conducting a spectacular attack with a plane crashing into a skyscraper, these are lone actors who don't communicate with a lot of people, don't take a lot of planning to conduct their attacks, mm -hmm. could attack almost anywhere and could do it uh, in a very short period of time. So there are not a lot of dots to connect. And so what that means is every dot matters that much more. And so part of what we're trying to do to help prevent those attacks uh, is enlist more and more the help of our state and local law enforcement partners who have eyes and ears in the community, work with community groups, schools, other kinds of organizations. Uh, because what you see is that more and more, uh, if the person who decides to commit an attack, there was somebody around them, a neighbor, a classmate, a coworker, a family member, who saw something change. Uh, and we need that person to be reaching out to law enforcement when, when they see that change before it's too late. Everybody's heard that, uh, that old saying, uh, if you see something, say something. And usually when you hear that, you're picturing what you're supposed to do if you see the, the backpack in the bus terminal or the airport. Obviously, we want people to say something then too. But here, what we're saying is, if you see something about somebody, say something. And that includes if you see something about them on saying it online. You know, Sometimes those tips to law enforcement are going to be the key to getting in front of, uh, there may not be that many clues out there and maybe that clue that could be the key. Um, so that's, that's sort of a description of kind of how we're approaching this. We have our, our joint terrorism task forces which tackle both foreign terrorism and domestic terrorism and they've got both squarely in their sights. We created a domestic terrorism hate crimes fusion cell to try to make sure we're bringing to bear both of those skill sets and we've actually prevented attacks on uh, against, for example, a synagogue in Colorado just by making sure that, the, again, we don't have the left hand, right hand problem. That, Fusion. Exactly. No, that's uh, outstanding. Yeah. Yep. No, that's excellent, Director, and I think that's an important message. So I want to change gears. There's no good segue to talk to China. You have been very strong in your messaging on China being a malign influence and really um, part of great power competition. They've uh, seemingly ramped up their game. China wages a global campaign called Operation Fox Hunt. You and I had an opportunity to talk about Fox Hunt last year in Sedona. And just for the audience, the wider audience, because you won't be familiar probably with that term necessarily, it's a malign program that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party of China, uses to target Chinese political rivals, dissidents, and critics of China. And last year when we spoke, there hadn't been a prosecution. Flash forward a year later, and the United States just had a successful pro prosecution. Three individuals were convicted of harassing a family on our shores here in the United States um, at the behest of China. So can you talk a little bit more? I'm not talking about the espionage threat. I'm literally talking about this policy of repression that is worldwide, but it also operates here, much similar to Iran operating here in our space. Could you talk a little bit about China? Repression sure. Policy. I mean, I, I, you know, most people are familiar with uh, China's well-documented um, efforts at repression and human rights abuses in China. What a lot of people don't know is that same repression is something that they've exported to other countries, including the United States. Uh, and unfortunately, in the United States, it, it primarily targets Chinese Americans. Those are the victims. Mm -hmm. uh, these are people who left China, who are often very critical uh, of the Chinese Communist Party and, and the regime. Um, and China doesn't like it when people criticize them. Uh, and the lengths that they will go to, this Operation Fox Hunt is styled as an anti-corruption campaign, but essentially it's an effort to threaten, harass, stalk, surveil, coerce um, 
people who criticize the regime and haul them back to China, threatening their families, etc. Um, and it, it is, in a sense, while it's distinct from the efforts to steal our intellectual property and to conduct the world's biggest hacking program and everything else, they fit together because they both reflect uh, a disregard for international norms uh, and the rule of law, and they complement each other in a uh, really uh, troubling way. So part of the point of silencing critics is so people won't call out their theft, their hacking, etc. So uh, it's important for us to try to do everything we can to reach out uh, to Chinese Americans uh, here in the United States who are being targeted with this kind of conduct uh, and to be there to help them. So I'm going to transition to another question. This happens to be my favorite question. I don't know if it's going to be your favorite question. <laughs> But I get to talk about our artifacts, albeit briefly. A sizable part of the International Spy Museum's artifact collection here at the museum focus on the spy versus spy contest that played out throughout the Cold War, Soviets versus the West. And recently, Robert Hansen, a former FBI agent who spied for Moscow for many years, a devastating breach. You know the story, it's painful. But with that historical case in mind, to what extent do tra traditional Russian espionage operations play out in the United States? I know there are sensitivities there, but are Russians executing traditional spy operations here in the United States. So uh, putting aside things like Russian cyber activity, That's things right. like that, right. So um, uh, first, I would say the Russian traditional counterintelligence threat continues to loom large. Um, I will say that over the last several years, uh, the United States has made, uh, I think, very positive, significant strides in reducing the size of the Russian intelligence officer footprint in the United States, um, kicking them out, in effect. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing some of our foreign partners do much the same in their, in their countries, especially uh, in the wake of both the Skripal yeah. the uh, poisoning. attack, the poisoning right. in, in the UK, uh, but also, obviously, their uh, unconscionable invasion of Ukraine. Um, but the Russian intelligence footprint, and by that I mean intelligence officers, uh, is still way too big in the United States. Uh, and it's something that we're constantly bumping up against um, and trying to uh, block and prevent and disrupt in every way we can. Um, the Russians also use not just traditional intelligence officers, but use cutouts. Uh, for example, we just had a case recently where they had, uh, had enlisted a Mexican citizen who was here in the United States to spy for them uh, here in the United States. Uh, so we are certainly uh, mindful of the fact that they have uh, a disproportionately large intelligence footprint here in the United States. Those people are here to advance Russia's interests. And if anybody needs a reminder of what Russia's interests are, you could just look at what's going on in Ukraine. Um, and so we never lose sight of the fact that these are the same people uh, that are involved in uh, unconscionable activity and aggression in, in Ukraine and the same kind of people who, uh, you know, conducted the attack against Skripal, the nerve, you know, the gas nerve agent uh, in the UK. Um, so we know who we're up against. Uh, right. That was a horrific attack to be sure. Uh, and we tell those stories here at the museum as well. So, uh, Director, final question. This has been a great talk on current threats, and I really appreciate that. And I think we'll have some questions that we'll go to in just a minute. But I really want to hear about the future, if you could share. What is the FBI, and more specifically, what are you thinking about in terms of the weeks and the months ahead, the next few years for the FBI? If you could share some of your insights, and then we'll take questions from our audience. I'd start with, we're not going to run out of things to do. Um, <laughs> That's very clear. Uh, I think the threats are going to become more complex, more sophisticated, and we're going to have to uh, evolve and adapt um, to stay ahead of those threats. To me, that is three parts of that. Um, 
innovation, partnerships, uh, and and the the people that we recruit um, to to join the FBI. On the innovation side, uh, we're constantly focused on ways in which we can deal with the advances of technology that are complicating our ability to um, to conduct our mission. You know, we have, if you think about almost every investigation we conduct and almost everything we do, there's three things in common. There's the evidence, the documentary evidence, which is the emails, the documents, whatever it happens to be. Um, there's the, the human information, the witnesses, the sources, and there's the money, the stuff, the people, the money. Well, the stuff, is getting harder and harder to lawfully access because of the way companies are designing encryption, which is basically no matter how good your legal process is, they're basically Can't hiding it. it. Um, and so that is going to make that a challenge. The people uh, in today's world of the digital breadcrumbs we all leave, combine that with things like facial recognition, AI, and so forth, it gets harder and harder to protect human sources from being compromised. And then the money, obviously more and more cryptocurrency is the way bad guys are going. So, and it gets harder to follow the money. So if we're not careful, we're gonna lose the stuff, the people and the money, in which case we are gonna run out of things to do. So, uh, so, that is it. so innovation is absolutely essential uh, to, to deal with all of those issues. I mentioned AI, obviously it's a topic that everybody's talking about all the time these days. We're very excited about some of the things that AI can do, but we're also very mindful of the ways in which AI is enhancing the bad guy's ability to be effective. Um, and so we are focused on innovation there. We um, are very proud of one of our guys recently. We've created a, to further foster innovation, we've created a formal patent program. And we have one of our guys just got a patent on something he came up with to basically help um, detect deep fakes, oh. which is one of the things that AI will yep. enable yep. to be more and more effective. So innovation, um, partnerships, uh, I've talked a lot about partnerships here this evening, both old and new, partnerships with state and local law enforcement, intelligence community, foreign partners, making those partnerships more and more uh, effective, always looking for what I would like to say is two plus two to make five. In other words, how do we get the FBI's to with some other partners too, and have an equal five or six or seven to achieve synergies to deal with all these threats. Um, but then non-traditional partners, uh, the private sector, academia, uh, certainly the cyber threat. Um, you know, if you look at our exposure as a country, something like 80% of our critical infrastructure is in the hands of the private sector. It's our critical infrastructure the bad guys are after. Our innovation, same thing, probably higher than 80%. Our personally identifiable information, it's in the hands of the private sector. Okay. So if we're gonna be effective in protecting America, we have to work more and more closely with the private sector. Um, and so I envision a world in which over the period that we're in, the, the cohesion and the partnership between the FBI and the business community and the academic community is going to just continue to become more and more robust as we help those parts of our society become uh, better, uh, more resilient against some of these threats. So innovation partnerships. And then the last part, the most important part, uh, is the people we bring into the FBI. Uh, you know, there's the saying that your people are your most important asset. That's certainly true at the FBI. It's what makes the FBI great is the quality of the people we bring in. Uh, and we are, I'm very proud of this. We are in, in the last several years uh, since I've been in this job recruiting people applying to be special agents at the FBI has shot up dramatically. Hmm. 2019, it tripled the pace it had been the several years when I, from when I started. Uh, we're hitting levels now that are higher than it's been in about a decade. Uh, this year is on track to be even higher than last year. Um, and it's all across the country. And these are people registering their desire to spend their careers, their lives, really working at the FBI. Serve the nation. Um, and they are not just, it's not just the quantity of people, it's the quality of the people. 
we're continuing to attract a huge number of people from law enforcement and the military. About 50% of our Quantico classes have advanced degrees. Um, and frankly, if you add law degrees, which some people think are advanced degrees, but you know, <laughs> uh, that's, that's controversial. Uh, it's probably closer to 60%. Um, and these are people who in this economy have a whole lot of choices uh, and they're sure as heck not choosing to join the FBI for the pay. I can, I can vouch for that. So, um, so we are attracting people in droves and this is at a time when law enforcement in general uh, is having the opposite experience. And I know that because I talk with chiefs and sheriffs from all 50 states. I'm talking to them pretty much every week. I hear about it constantly they're all going in the opposite direction. That's right. Um, and uh, so we need to be able to attract great people to the FBI. We are. But I think that's a, a very, very important part uh, of our future in terms of staying ahead of the threats. And, and the advantage to having those great numbers is that we're recruiting people with you know, STEM backgrounds, different types of scientific and engineering backgrounds without, without compromising on the core values uh, and character that I think is, um, to me, non-negotiable and kind of the essence of who we are. That's a positive trajectory. So let's end our segment with a transition to Amanda because she has some questions uh, and hopefully we'll get some good ones from our audience. We always do. So what do you have there, Amanda? Well, I'll tell you what else we're not going to run out of questions. <laughs> we are not going to get to all of them. but. Uh, some people really sent questions in early, and this was a very delightful one. So we thought we'd give you a little break with this first one. Can spies be any age, or do you have to be young and spry to spy? <laughs> sent from a lady who says that Melissa McCarthy and spy is one of her favorites. Uh, well, um, uh, as a guy in his 50s, uh, I think uh, 50s are the new 30s. Um, uh, and certainly, I like to think I'm younger and younger all the time, even if my family tells me quite the opposite. Um, it w certainly, when we are going after spies, we see spies of all ages. In fact, recently, we had, uh, I think in the span of a single week, a couple of different cases where different intelligence services um, had, were using guys in their 70s, and my reaction was, yeah, go, cool. you know, and then I'm like, oh, okay, no, that's probably not a good thing. Uh, but it just goes to show that, uh, you know, people in their 70s can be pretty formidable, and I'm looking forward to it. Chris, do you have any comment on that? No. No. <laughs> I wish I was in my 50s, is what I wanted to say. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that Chris is in his 70s. So. Now, this one uh, came in virtually. We've had a number about these, um, this topic. And you kind of touched on artificial intelligence earlier, but do you want to elaborate on how it is affecting the FBI and its intelligence gathering? Uh, sure. So, that, I mean, that's a huge topic, obviously. Um, like maybe the best way to do it uh, concisely is uh, we sort of think of AI in three buckets, uh, both offense and defense. Offense, we're obviously doing all kinds of things. I mentioned the guy who'd gotten the patent uh, just recently. Right. But we're doing all kinds of things to try to figure out how we can responsibly <clears throat> use AI to go after the bad guys. That's obviously a very important part. Uh, of our future. But in many ways, what I'm more focused on right now are the other two ways, the sort of the defense side of it, the ways in which AI is either enhancing or enabling bad guys to be more effective in the threats they pose, or third category of the three, the ways in which our foreign adversaries, especially the Chinese, are trying to steal our AI. Um, you know, America leads the world in AI development. I think something like 18 of the 20 most uh, uh, successful AI companies in the world are American. Um, needless to say, that puts a gigantic bullseye on them from the Chinese government. If I jump back to the, that middle category, ways in which AI is in, enabling bad guys to do their things, it, it's essentially, it's a, we look at it a little bit like the way in which 
when the internet first came around, the way that just exploded all kinds of malicious activity. We're seeing it in terms of AI making phishing emails more effective. We're seeing it uh, AI in terms of uh, virtual kidnappings. I don't know how many people here are familiar with virtual kidnappings, but that's when somebody calls you and they typically target the elderly, this. but they say, you know, hey, we've kidnapped your son or your daughter, and if you don't wire money to this account without hanging up, we're going to, you know, kill him. Um, well, that's scary enough, but AI is now enabling some bad guys to spoof your son or daughter's voice. I've seen and so that. then you hear the call, and in the background, you hear what sounds like your son or daughter's voice, and you're even more likely to, to think this must be the real deal. Uh, so those are just a few examples. AI, we're also seeing AI, AI being used as a way for bad guys to conduct uh, searches online that you can't track and follow. I mean, there's a whole slew of things. At the moment, at the moment, what AI is really doing is enabling less sophisticated bad guys to be more successful and effective than they otherwise would have. Think of it like, you know, you're all familiar with, you get the, the phishing email that's, you can tell was written by somebody for whom English is not a first language and you kind of know I shouldn't fall for this. Well, AI is already quickly enabling a lot of those people to sound a lot more credible and a lot more like fluent natural English speakers. So it's going to get harder. Uh, what I'm really worried about is a few years from now, we're going to see the most sophisticated actors be able to up their game using AI. AI is not quite yet at the point where the most sophisticated adversaries, like they're not using chat GPT to do their stuff. Like they've already, they're already up here, but you give it a few more years and there's going to be things that'll enable them to take it to a whole nother level. I mentioned the Chinese and the theft of AI. They have a bigger hacking program than that of every major nation combined. They have a massive foreign influence, malign foreign influence campaign, and they've, t they've stolen more of Americans' uh, personally identifiable information than every nation combined. If you put all that together with AI, it's going to enable their hacking and their foreign influence campaigns and so forth to become exponentially more effective because it allows them to essentially uh, train the machine learning models to be more effective. So you could have a snowballing effect of what's already a very significant threat. So yes, we're very excited about how we can use AI in offense, but at the moment we're primarily focused on how we can help protect people from the ways in which AI is going to be misused and already is being misused. Oh, great points. I mean, it's double-edged, right? Yep. That's, that's the issue. I mean, every new technology I have the same reaction, uh, and AI is no exception. My first reaction is, wow, we can do that? <laughs> and then my section react, second reaction is, oh, no. <laughs> you mean they can do that? Um, right. And, of course, we're, we try very hard uh, and work very hard and are very proud of the fact that we're constrained by the rule of law in our use of these technologies. The bad guys... They throw that stuff out the window, so they're, they're able to go after these, use these technologies with uh, what they might view as a competitive advantage. Yeah, no boundaries for yeah. them. Thanks, Amanda. What was an unexpected challenge you have faced as director? That comes from this room. Do you think someone was involved? <laughs> <laughs> an unexpected challenge. Uh, I mean, I think the uh, ability to focus on um, the longer term over, this is going to be sort of somewhat surprising answer. I, having been around the FBI quite a bit earlier in my career, like I said, having been in FBI headquarters on the day of 9-11, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a stranger to how the FBI, including today's FBI, operates, and I, and I wasn't when I started in this job. So a lot of the challenges I was anticipating. But I think in many ways the thing that worries me the most is we constantly need to be thinking about the threats uh, that are three or four years from now that aren't upon us right now. And it's, it's been an unexpectedly, unexpectedly hard challenge 
to find the time and to get everybody to be able to focus on those things because the crisis of the moment. Yeah. The so next dominates, ridge line. Right. You know, the, uh, always a challenge. the former Secretary Rumsfeld uh, famously said, there's the known known, there's the known unknown, and then there's the unknown unknown. <laughs> uh, the FBI is very good and always has been good at the known known. Uh, increasingly, post 9-11, the FBI is actually quite good at the known unknown. We know we need to learn more about this gap or get ahead of this threat. But it's the unknown unknown that you know, that I worry about. And the only way you're going to do that is somehow finding uh, the time to get people to focus on what's the threat that's going to be all we're talking about three years from now that we haven't anticipated yet. Uh, and I do wish that we could find more time not to play whack-a-mole with some of the, uh, the issues of the day and spend a little more time focused on yeah, that. Yeah, that's a perennial challenge, isn't it? I'm going to go off road a little bit because I am so inspired by this question. We have a classroom of high school students watching and they want to know the best way to get involved in the FBI. And that gels with a lot of questions from people saying, what would you say to aspiring Intel students? And this is our last question. Unfortunately, we're about out of time. Well, we're always recruiting. Uh, and, um, the, I would say the best way to apply to get your foot in the door, you know, we have a great internship program. I guess full disclosure, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of people applying. The numbers are pretty breathtaking. So it, it is very selective, but uh, that's a great way to kind of get introduced to the FBI. That's an internship program that's really more focused on obviously people in college and beyond. Uh, but that's one thing to focus on. Um, I, I, you know, Sometimes people ask me, is there some course of study that you're supposed to do? And there's all these myths over time. Well, the FBI only hires lawyers and accountants. Oh, the FBI only hires people in law enforcement. Oh, the FBI only hires people who speak Farsi or speak Mandarin or, you know. No, 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 we, we recruit from all of those things. It's far more important that we have people who have good critical reasoning skills, good personal skills um, and uh, impeccable integrity. Um, and if you focus on those things, uh, that's far more important uh, to a path to the FBI than what major you choose or what summer job you have. Um, and I will say, uh, there's no better place to work. Um, you know, to uh, have as your job to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution uh, is a pretty incredible thing. Um, you know, think about your friends. Hey, what do you do for them? I protect the American people and I uphold the Constitution, you know. Uh, uh, and I sometimes have told the story um, about, uh, and everybody in the FBI has had their own moments like this, but where the light bulb kind of goes on and you sort of rem really realize how meaningful the work can be. Uh, and, and one of those moments for me, which I've reflected on a lot, when my daughter, who's now in her late 20s, but when she was like four or five years old, uh, and I was a, a young prosecutor working with FBI agents every day in Atlanta, um, and they had Dad's Day at her nursery school. So as part of Dad's Day, they asked all the little boys and girls uh, a series of questions about their dads, and then they wrote the answers that they got from the kids down on these um, construction paper teddy bears. And then they put the teddy bears up on the bulletin board. So of course, I and all the other fathers come into the classroom for Dad's Day, and we're standing there, and I'm looking up at this sea of teddy bears. And uh, there's another dad, like, kind of like you and I right here, is like right next to me. And he keeps looking over at me, so I look over at him, and he said, hey man, you mind if I ask what you do for a living? So I looked up at my daughter's teddy bear, and the question was, you know, what does your dad do at work? Uh, and it said, my daddy and his friends put bad guys in jail and help keep us all safe. And I'm a normal guy, so I look over at his teddy bear. His teddy bear said, my daddy talks on the phone all day so mommy and I can buy nice stuff. <laughs> <laughs>
And I may be a little slow on the uptake, but even for me in that moment, that light bulb went on and I thought, wow, if you want to do something for a living that even you know, a five-year-old little girl can actually appreciate as, uh, as meaningful and impactful, um, you'd be in the right place. Well, that's a powerful story. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, are we about wrapped? Yeah, do you have any remarks before I give I just want to thank question? our audience virtually as well as here. Thank you for coming to Spy Museum on this uh, rather warm Washington, D.C. evening. And, Director, it's great to see you again. We're super grateful that we could have you here and share your insights and help educate the public and uh, give them the understanding and the insights that they glean from hearing you talk about the FBI and national security problems. We're really grateful. Thank you. Well, thank you. Great to be here. Bye.